Well, I should just say that it's a, it's a, it's been a great pleasure being here at this conference um, over the last over the last three days, and uh, it's a particular honour to have an invitation um, to to speak at this this president's panel, and for that invitation to be um, issued by Rowan, who clearly from the reception last night is just such a highly respected um, president and also a president held in real, really warm affection. So, so thank you very much for the invitation and thank you to all the organisers of the conference. You'll see um, that um, I'm being a little bit promiscuous in my um, disciplinary affiliations here from the title um, of this talk. Um, the high art and the radiators are actually... Um, actually appear in the, in the prose of Arnold Bennett, um, who will make an appearance uh, in, this, in this reflection on, um, on periodization. And um, the first thing that I want to start off with is a photograph, because photographs stage relationships between generations and can be said to mark implicit boundaries between periods. This example appears in The Life of Joseph Hooker by Leonard Huxley, uh, the son of Thomas Henry Huxley, which was published in 1918, and it's a scene from Charles Darwin's centenary in 1909. Now, the almost one-year-old baby um, held here by Henrietta Huxley, widow of Darwin's bulldog, is Ursula Darwin, um, daughter of Bernard Darwin. Ursula was born in 1908 to Bernard, the son of Francis Darwin, third son of Charles. The grown-up uh, grown Ursula later married the artist Julian Trevelyan before marrying the sculptor Norman Momans. Remarkably, Ursula, who herself became um, a ceramic artist, a potter in the tradition of Josiah Wedgwood, of whom she was a direct descendant, was still alive at the point of the Darwin Bicentenary of 2009. Here she is, continuing um, to live uh, a creative life into, <laughs> into older age. And I know that the, the opening panel um, reflected on that kind of idea about later life creativity, uh, which I've been doing work on uh, recently in, in, in recent years, and I'll, I'll say more about that um, as, I, as, I, as, as, as I go, go on. Anyway, Ursula, uh, Ursula Moments died in 2010, one year after two, uh, 2009, and she was aged 101. Now, I draw on this photograph to reflect on periodization. Vestigial representatives of the Victorian and Edwardian periods continue just um, to be in touch with our own time. Now, just to go back to that um, photograph, a number of details in this image comment, I think, on periods, continuity, and transition. Touch, in which the very idea of tradition is grounded, is manifest in the caring hole in which Henrietta Huxley takes baby Ursula Darwin. Now, interestingly, this is a matrilineal gathering presided over by Lady Hooker, looking over the shoulders uh, of the other two. And there's only one male here, Hooker. But he's a figure of the early pioneering days of scientific naturalism, a hallmark of the Victorian period, and the early confidant and the of the theorist of evolution, Charles Darwin. Famously, it's uh, Hooker to whom um, Darwin says in 1844, it's like confessing a murder, um, what, I've, you know, what, I, what I've come up with. Science here, it suggests, is to be part on, passed on, though women are as involved in the mediation as men, and it will be the art of the Wedgwoods that takes root, as, we'll see, as we see in Ursula. And, of course, the photograph is a form of sensuous engagement. The body of the ageing male luminary is both proof of a record of achievement and the stark presentation of the challenge of discontinuity, a factor with which Carl Pearson confronted the founding figures of British sociology in 1904. I think it's important to, mark, so to see that period of the uh, 1890s and the, the transitional, period, transitional years into the, into, the, into the 20th century as a moment of significant disciplinary reconfiguration, the birth of certain kinds of disciplines, one being um, sociology. Carl Pearson, uh, at a meeting of the founding of the um, Sociological Society in 1904, which led to the formation of the journal Sociological Review, is here with Francis Galton. And 
In that meeting, he was conscious of the passing of the Victorian age. Here's the quote. And it's a question and it's a challenge. How is the next generation of Englishmen to be mentally and physically equal to the past generation, which has provided us with the great Victorian statesmen, writers and men of science, most of whom are no more, but which has not entirely ceased to be as long as we can see Francis Galton in the flesh. <laughs> Francis Galton was present uh, at that meeting. Carl Pearson was presiding. Here you see Galton in, um, in, 19, uh, in, in 1900, I think it's 19, 1909, so just, to, just, just two years before, just two years before his death. So what it seems to me, using this photographic evidence, is that the photograph as a distinctive phenomenon of the 19th century is an alibi for flesh, for the solid presence of Victorian achievement. Periodisation. Why should we continue to define our period around the reign of a monarch who happened to have had longevity thrust upon her? Shouldn't we think instead about a 19th century, or even a long 19th century, beginning in the 1790s and ending in 1914, perhaps even 1918? The first point to make, of course, is that we all have different investments in the question, depending on our scholarly investments. This image clearly comes out of mind, researching as I am the history of the evolutionary sciences and the relationship between key Victorian families who were themselves invested in the great biological questions of the 19th century as the next generation moved into the 20th century. If I begin with an artefact, a photograph, I, or two photo, three photographs, and I proceed via a question of meanings, which I see as central to the significance of period, the question of periodization, along with questions of generation, and intergenerational contact. Now for context, to put this debate into some kind of context, um, I want to go back to uh, a round table, that distinctive feature of the Journal of Victorian Culture um, that was commissioned in, um, in, 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 in almost 10 years ago. So I can't quite manage an anniversary for you. We like anniversaries at this conference, but it's nine years rather than, uh, rather than 10, which would, have, uh, which would have been neater. But it was, uh, it was, it was put together, it, it was published in 2006. And it focused on the um, groundbreaking work of the, his, the social historian Richard Price. In British Society, 1680 to 1880, published in 1999, the historian Richard Price argued that the Victorian period was really an extension of a long 18th century age of improvement that began in 1680. For Price, the most important decade in the 19th century was the 1880s, so right at its end, which brought to an end many of the long trends of manufacture and commerce which were channeled into forms of localism and voluntarism in politics, imperialism in foreign relations and trade, organised, as they all had been, uh, around a dialectic of expansion and containment. Price argued that from the 1880s, a new, less assured place in the world gave birth to a new kind of British state, a new politics, a new and more defensive imperialism. Price's socio-structural functionalism developed a bold thesis addressed by a number of figures in the roundtable debate. Broadly endorsed by um, the historian jo uh, Joanna Innes, um, though questioned much more by Francis O'Gorman as a literary historian, uh, who took 1680 to be, quote, a self-evidently impossible inaugural date for a literary historian. Um, and if you think about it, the example that uh, Francis uses is, uh, can you write a history of the novel from Afra Ben to George Eliot? Well, yes, you can, but it won't be premised on continuity. That's for sure. Price's thoughtful response engaged with all the contributors, including the economic historian Tim Alburn. But he also engaged, interestingly, with Martin Hewitt, um, who was formulating at that time his influential ideas about why the notion of Victorian Britain does make sense, uh, and which he published in Victorian Studies also in that year of 2006. So this was a rich year for thinking about periodisation. A crucial aspect of Martin's arguments depended on ideas about cultures of visuality, generated in part by new scientific and technological knowledge that was distinctly taking root in the 1830s and 1840s. 
Price acknowledged that he'd, in responding to Martin, um, Price acknowledged that he'd significantly underplayed the role of culture in his account, and conceding that these forms of visuality and scientific knowledge may indeed have been important if, he says, they were agents of destabilisation or if they were agents that redrew boundaries. So he's talking about agency. Now, it's a striking framing of the question, and it's deserving of some kind of answer. Can knowledge and artefacts have agency in helping us to think about periodization? And I guess um, thinking, uh, I, I guess that thing theorists and exponents of actor network theory say that they do, and these are increasingly, I think, having influence on the, on the, on the shaping of the field. And I'm thinking particularly about the importance of um, actor network theory in the work of uh, Regina Gagne, for example, in her work on global, global circulation. Now, before getting an art to an answer um, to the question, uh, it's not, it's only a provisional answer, as all answers, as all answers in this conference uh, are tending to be. Um, it's helpful to remind ourselves of the companion JBC uh, roundtable, which appeared in the second issue uh, of 2006, 11 2. We could only manage two issues in those days. It was, that was pressure. Um, and that roundtable posed the question, when did the Victorian period end? Now, if Stephen Kern placed, us, uh, placed it squarely with the advent of Einstein's relativity and the end of the Newtonian universe in science and literary modernism and experimental narrative, and Barbara Kane argued for new patterns of gender relations that achieved their focus in Bloomsbury, the art historian David Peters Corbett argued for something more tentative. This is his quote. Perhaps what we need is a sort of micro-history, Studies of moments and connections that are not depended on, on the framing devices of periodization. The study of British art, he concluded, in the years either side of 1900 is at a stage where it needs this kind of close attention. Now, to my own disciplinary home, allegedly, um, to literature, nobody does, and, and through literature, incidentally, I, 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 find, my, I find my high art. Nobody does close, close attention quite like the novelist Arnold Bennett and in, both lit, uh, arti in both artistic, fine art matters and also in, 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 in literary matters. And to a less acknowledged extent, technological matters, which is where my radiators come in. If you've been around the potteries for 20 years, as I have, you can't escape Arnold Bennett, who gave us a vivid portrait of an industrial locality, the Five Towns, and wrote about the Victorian period from the perspective of the Edwardian period and the war years, the years leading to the advent of modernism. In fact, Bennett provides a source of reflection on the period we conventionally think about as Victorian, and his Five Town novels provide a grand sweep of that period. And so, for instance, in The Old Wives' Tale from 1908, and I'll finish by talking a little bit more about The Old Wives', wives Tale uh, at the end of the, the presentation, stroke-afflicted, bedridden Mr. Baines in the 1860s is remembered as the bold and vigorous spokesman for civic order and property when he faced down the Chartist rioters in 1830s Bursley. What I'm going to focus on um, from, from Bennett is actually one of his rather less well-regarded novels, um, These Twain, published in 1916, which was the third volume in the Clayhanger trilogy, the first volume for which um, Clayhanger was a highly regarded Bildungsroman, and Martin alluded to it in his work, in, in his, present, in his uh, talk this morning, about the importance of, um, uh, of, 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 of Bennett as, as somebody who marks that kind of generational um, change and also reflects on the, on the period. So, Clayhanger, the first volume, highly regarded buildings, uh, Bildungsroman, though as I now want to show, um, using a terrible joke, pun or whatever, um, Bennett's work is never far away from being a buildings roman. Um, <laughs> brickiness was what Virginia Woolf called it, disparagingly in that famous essay, uh, Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, brickiness. Now, to my mind, Bennett's awareness of the built environment can be much more subtle than that. It contributes to debates about periodicity. Beginning as it does in 1892, the story of Edwin Clayhanger's youth having begun in the late 1860s. The Victorian period is an early topic of discussion, actually, in these twain, 
um, set as it is, uh, as I said, in, 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 18, in 1892. And, and it figures um, amidst a discussion of Giovanni Bellini's Agony in the Garden from roughly 1465, Lord Leighton's um, Bath of Psyche, and a radiator. I'll come back to the radiator in a bit. We're given our initial tour of Edwin's hallway in his substantial um, townhouse in Bleakridge, inherited from his father Darius, a master printer. The narrator points out to us a reproduction of Bellini's Agony in the Garden. This is significant because Edwin has gleaned from a periodical that Bellini is one of the finest artists in the world. The foreshortening of the figure here, of the apostle, is pointed out as being technically masterful, modern, um, forward forward looking. What's significant here is that something has been removed from the house, uh, from elsewhere in the house, notably the bedroom, and that is Leighton's Bath of Psyche. This has been removed from the bedroom and Edwin has just got married. Um, so this is the, 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 the removal of this, however, is pointed out as being um, the, 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 the kind of uh, the moment of the arrival of the, uh, of, the, of, 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 the of the Bellini. Now the narrator also, <coughs> sorry, I slightly lost my place. Just to go back, um, and this has been banished from the um, from, from 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 the house. And the quote is. Um, what, well, what we're looking at is a, is a bigger transformation in taste. And this is the key quote um, for, which, which leads us back to the issue of periodization. In a few months, all Victorian phenomena had been put on trial, and most of them condemned. So um, Leighton's Bath of Psyche is part of that kind of Victorian... Um, the Victorian... the banishment of the Victorians um, from... Uh, from, 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 from from Edwin's, from Edwin's house. But then there's also that radiator um, in the hall. The radiator in the hall. If the Bellini, and this is just a, a, an illustration taken from a, from a, um, a kind of household man, uh, uh, catalog from, uh, from, a, from, a, from, from a sales, from a sales room in, uh, in, 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 in Edinburgh, roughly from the, roughly from the, from, from the period. If the Bellini improves the aesthetic atmosphere, the new radiator, most likely an American import in 1892, is, quote, his pet lamb, his mistress, this is strange, <laughs> that seeks to abolish drafts and diffuse warmth. The Bellini and the radiator really are equivalents that seek, uh, they th really are equivalents, and, quote, such inner experiences were part of his interest in life. Such inner experiences were part of his interest in life. Bennett is, of course, no Arnold. Inwardness and radiators are here forced together. And we should note that Bellini, the Bellini that's, that's, that's displayed in the hall, is a mechanical reproduction, a photogravure version that actually would have highlighted um, the composition's use of uh, dark shadow, the grounds, as it's claimed, um, for the, for the techni technological genius. So we can see this kind of um, entry into the household of... Um, of high art mediated by, um, mediated by technology and particularly um, by, by photographic um, technology. Now, the narrator also remarks that Edwin's Auntie Hamps, um, a, a figure who crosses the, 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 the trilogy, um, a Methodist, um, something of a hypocrite, um, makes a kind of a profession of it, really, and is styled as an aged Victorian, an aged Victorian, celebrates the arrival of the representation of Christ's agony and is pleased at the removal of Leighton's so-called licentious print. However, the politics of Victorian taste are marked as much more complex by Bennett than simply the overthrow of aged Victorianism. After all, aged Victorianism likes what it sees in the Bellini. Now, it seems to me that Bennett makes Edwin abandon the neoclassical aestheticism of Leighton and participate instead in Ruskin's positive re-evaluation of Bellini after 1870 part, incidentally, of the narrative that would see the Venetian artist of the 15th century positively received by um, Roger Fry in 1899 and later 
the Bloomsbury generation. So where is this narrative heading? It's rather striking and rather interesting, it seems to me. And in that context, it seems to me that it's an example of what Peter Corbett sees as a micro-narrative with complex implications for the field of art history and distinctively, because this is Bennett, domestic improvement in comfort. Moreover, in making this point, we are never permitted to forget that taste is a dynamic matter of age, generation and intergenerational relations. Edwin's assessment of his 36-year-old self is that he's getting on in years. He's getting on in years as a householder. Bennett, as a novelist, is, I would argue, supremely attentive to age and that what age may mean in the historical process. Going back, I think, to some of the questions that Martin was raising this morning. And it's worth recalling that Raymond Williams' Culture and Society, if we're looking for, for models of thinking about generations, they are there in Williams' work, in the long revolution, um, but also in Culture and Society, which begins, you might remember, um, with a table stating comparatively at which year in the period 1780 to 1950 the figures populating his study had reached 25. <coughs> Conclusion. I want to conclude by thinking about the implications of Bennett's awareness of age based on my own recent, not primarily Victorian research on ageing, reflecting on what this may mean for Victorian studies and for our understanding of the Victorian period. The work, with, uh, which was funded by the New Dynamics of Ageing project, which was a, a cross-council project, um, with a team of cultural and critical gerontologists involved research into the significance of our local theatre, the Victoria Theatre, the New Vic from 1986 in North Staffordshire. We were researching its significance to um, its local community since the year of 1962, its foundation. Our focus was precisely interested in the dynamic relationship between an ageing institution and an ageing community. Extensive interviewing provided rich materials, but so too the theatre's representations of ageing recorded in, the, in its archive. As a Victorianist, I was struck by the way in which the theatre's distinctive documentary outputs from the 1960s revived and reflected on a Victorian past and distinctive defining features of its periodicity. Um, industrial production reflected through the, um, the pottery industry of the 1830s and the 40s and the North Staffordshire Railway between 1840 and 1920. This was supplemented by the recurrent adaptations of the work of Bennett, key among them for us, The Old Wives' Tale, because of course it's one of the few um, early 20th century novels to focus so intensively um, on the experience and, and, and meaning of, um, of, of, of ageing. This was adapted uh, in 1971 by Joyce Cheeseman, um, and that became a, that becomes a kind of a key, one of the, 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 the key things that I particularly looked at and 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 did so as um, as, a, as as a Victorianist. Um, it interrogates the aging process as experienced by two um, sisters. Uh, that's a that's a that's a still from the uh, from the from the theatrical production which uh, which was staged in in, in 1971. And it ends uh, with an image of defiant local dem democratic participation by the aged and sciatica racked Constance Povey. Um, a democratic contest mobilised precisely by the politics of locality. And you can't help feeling that Richard Price, as a social historian, would really rather have approved of, of, of that manifestation of his argument extending into the potteries. Bennett's tactic of showing us the parallel lives of the two sisters between the 1860s and 1907 shows ageing as a process and a site for the generation of meaning through generations. To this end, Bennett shows how the ageing Bain sisters populated a wider <laughs> historical narrative that could look beyond the confines of the British, constru of British constructions of Victorianism. Sophia, the other sister, uh, her elopement with her salesman lover to Paris takes the reader away from the potteries and into what Benjamin would call the capital of the 19th century, as it toppled into crisis and siege at the collapse of the Second Empire. I contend then, finally, that Arnold Bennett's brickiness extends to Baron Hausmann's Paris and his acute sensitivity to ageing takes us into a sense of the 19th century that was being built in multiplicity of parallel locations. This complex sense of the 19th century was extended further by the Victoria Theatre, Stoke-on-Trent, through the theatrical adaptation of Bennett. In and around the potteries in August 1971, Neo-Victorianism was born. <laughs>
with apologies to Victoria, with, to, to Virginia Woolf. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks to Rowan for the invitation to speak um, at this round table. And um, what follows is going to be a, a brief and quite speculative response to the invitation to speak about periodization. Uh, is that the one? Okay. I want to begin with what I think are, are two quite simple um, observations. First, that the uh, question of periodizing the Victorians is bound up with the question of historical continuity and change, not entirely perhaps, but certainly surely to some extent. When does change happen? When does change prevail over continuity and so on? Uh, my second observation is that this is a very difficult question, the question of continuity and change. How, after all, uh, should we measure and assess change? Do we use statistics or do we use more cultural uh, qualitative measures? And where should we locate change or continuity in society, uh, the economy, uh, perhaps in politics, the state? Or again, do we loc locate it in ideas or do we locate it, uh, this is change or continuity, in material practices or perhaps in all of these domains? Now, um, more might be said in this vein, reviewing the historiography and so on and so forth. Um, but instead, in the 10 minutes afforded to me here, I want to sketch, uh, speculatively, uh, one way in which we might perhaps uh, repose the question of continuity and change in the 19th century. I then want to give an example. So, to begin, uh, in the fourth instalment of his Modern World System series, entitled Centrist Liberalism Triumphant, Emmanuel Wallerstein begins by arguing that the 19th century witnessed, I quote, a normalisation of change, or at least in Britain and France, which form his principal focus, and where change itself became taken for granted. Others have made uh, the same point, um, uh, including Reinhard uh, Kasselk, who has suggested that the birth of modern ideologies, the start of the 19th century, was premised on the assumption of change. Uh, like Wallerstein, he suggests that partly uh, what distinguished these ideologies was the degree of change they were willing to consent to and encourage. And this, I think, is perhaps well known. Crudely, uh, conservatism was suspicious of revolutionary and radical change. Radicalism, by contrast, was pro-change. And Whiggish, centrist liberalism was somewhere in between. It was not then about being uh, anti-change, uh, uh, given its inevitable grain. Rather, it's about how one managed change, change that was now imagined as inevitable. Indeed, change as continuum. Um, and um, as Kosalik suggests, politics itself became intrinsically historical, much as time itself became fundamental to the sciences and indeed all areas of Victorian culture. Jerome Buckley long ago wrote about the triumph of time during the Victorian period. Robin Gilmore's The Victorian Period opens with a chapter entitled The Sense of Time and the Uses of History. And uh, illustrative examples abound. Uh, I could have used uh, some of those that perhaps Martin uh, quoted this morning from, from Mill uh, uh, and Badgett, um, but it is one um, from uh, Disraeli, 1867. Equally, if just as importantly, just as importantly, we also know that we should be careful about inferring change in society at large, in the state, economy, politics, just because elites, scientists, and artists were grappling with time and experiencing change in new ways. Um, part of uh, Richard Price's argument in his British Society, 1680 to 1880, is that we should not be seduced by the Victorians' own sense of change, at least until 1880, when things really 
did change. And I'm grateful to uh, David uh, uh, for elaborating Richard's Price's argument earlier on. And more broadly, of course, I think no longer uh, do uh, uh, Victorianists, no longer do we speak of an industrial revolution or, uh, or again, uh, a revolution in government. Uh, the general uh, uh, trend, I think, uh, uh, crudely, is that historians now tend to point towards complex admixtures of the new and the old and the persistence and reworking of new old ideals and, and practices alongside the new and so on. The assumption here, I think, is that periodization is a question of weighing up degrees of change and continuity, their extent, speed and social reach, and then positing a break at a particular point when change seems to dominate over continuity. But what if, uh, what if this is to pose the question of continuity and change only in a particular kind of way? What if, instead, we might develop the argument that one place where we might look for change is precisely in the way people have imagined and practiced continuity and change in the past? What if, moreover, we might look for new forms of change and, and new forms of continuity so that the two go together, entering into new kinds of relations? And that's what I want to very briefly say now. Um, so I take my bearings um, here from Marcel Gaucher's The Disenchantment of the World, his extended uh, philosophical essay on the advent of secular modernity in Western Europe, where he writes of the power of the identical and the society of the new. In brief, his argument is that during the early modern period, the guarantors of continuity and perpetuity through time had been an established church and aristocracy, and the assumption they embodied, quite literally, quite literally, uh, the assumption that they embodied a hierarchical Christian Platonic great chain of being. Uh, that's in, in brief. Uh, during the late 18th and early 19th century, however, this assumption was eventually displaced by the elevation of a series of impersonal and abstract entities, in particular the nation, the market, the state and society as new sources of collective continuity with the crucial difference that they are also seen, that these new collective abstract entities are also seen as the crucible and as the product of change, which is to say that in and through which change takes place. Um, so the thrust of his argument, I think, is apparent in the quote on PowerPoint. It is not, he stresses, about specific ideas of time, of which there might be hundreds and thousands. He suggests uh, it's actually a question of a broadly based culture of change, whereby change is rooted in and secured by collective entities that are also thought to transcend change and therefore persist on a continuous basis. As he elaborates somewhat playfully, we, uh, us moderns that is, have actually changed less than we think because beneath our worship of novelty remains a good deal of faith in the immutable. In immutable entities uh, uh, such as the nation or a society or an economy. Um, like Wallerstein, and Kasselik then, Gaucher, is also postulating a normalization of change. The difference is that for Gaucher, this is structurally linked to the emergence of a series of abstract collective entities that at once embody and transcend change. Or put another way, for Gaucher, um, it's not a matter of more or less change and continuity. Um, rather, it's about examining how, and historically, the two entered into new relations with one another. So uh, is there uh, any mileage in this? Um, certainly, I think uh, Charles Taylor's A Secular Age offers a similar reading of uh, the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Looking especially at France, Britain, and, and America, or the US, um, Taylor recovers how the nation and the people, as well as public opinion, uh, were gradually established as crucial points of reference in terms of enabling new kinds of collective agency and temporality. Equally, I think uh, uh, um, one might read 
uh, James Vernon's uh, Distant Strangers with these considerations in mind to the extent that he's also concerned with the rise of, the history of, more abstract and anonymous forms of society and statecraft, polity and economy and how they were practiced and lived out. Okay, so far then, uh, um, so, so abstract. I want to end now by offering a brief example of the emergence of a new axis, if you like, of continuity and change, continuity and change, namely the, the, the case of official um, statistics. And um, there, is, there is a long uh, genealogy here, of course, stretching back to early modern accounting practices and, and sporadic attempts at so-called political arithmetic from the late 17th century. Yet most historians agree that the 1820s and 1830s constitute a watershed. Nonetheless, in the words of Ian Hacking, it was at this point, in these decades, that, that, that marked the advent of what he called an avalanche of printed numbers in Western Europe. And Britain was no exception. The Board of Trade establishes a statistical department in 1832 to look at domestic trade and international flows of goods. The new poor law bureaucracy, 1834, turned on greater levels of, of, of numerical accounting. Home Office uh, reformed uh, its collection of criminal statistics, 1835. The General Register Office, births, deaths and marriages, that began work in 1837 all part, indeed, of a broader expansion in the amount of information generated for and by the British state. And this avalanche of numbers would, 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 would fall with ever more intensity thereafter. It's still an avalanche we're dealing with uh, uh, today in our, in our highly information-rich world. So, so what then uh, was this a change to, we might ask? Uh, well, one way of looking at this shift is to a new culture of articulating time and change, and in particular change as statistical time <coughs> series, change as peaks and troughs in data, as degrees of movement away or towards national averages, or change as relative rates of regress or progress, acceleration and deceleration. A flourishing, the institutionalization, I'll come to that in a second, of new ways of analyzing spatial temporal variations in the crime rate and levels of incarceration, in births and deaths, uh, birth and death rates, uh, the import and export of goods, of property prices, wage rates, consumer goods, and so on. And this data was then mobilized by MPs and pressure groups, voluntary societies, and MPs. So a new culture of, 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 of uh, uh, articulating change, um, but equally, Equally, final point, this avalanche of printed numbers also, I think, constitutes a shift to a new kind of, a new culture of continuity. And two strands of this might be mentioned. The first is more practical and administrative, namely the generation of these statistics according to pre-programmed, regular, ongoing, continual temporal rhythms. From here on, the production of statistics, but also practices like form filling, collation, and so on, uh, does not fluctuate or deviate. Rather, it has a kind of chronological continuity to it, which is regular. Uh, um, uh, you know, again, annual, quarterly, and in some instances, weekly. Um, and decennial, also, you know, the census and things like that. Secondly, second strand, and as historians of statistics have argued, uh, Ian Hacking, uh, uh, Ted Porter, but also um, uh, Mary Poovey. Uh, um, this great proliferation of data helped to reify and disaggregate a series of collective agents in which this change might be located. Um, one of these is the state itself, uh, the very source <coughs> of these uh, statistics, uh, but also, and just as crucially, uh, domain of society and popular habits, uh, domain of finance and trade, and later, uh, 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 an entity later known as the, the economy. All new and intricate domains of dynamic change, of course, of course, but equally also collective domains whose very dynamism, to return to Gaucher, attested to their abstract permanence and continuity through uh, time. So to conclude, um, what I've tried to outline here, or really, 
uh, only moot, is one way in which the question of continuity and change in the long or short 19th century might be reposed. It's been necessarily uh, uh, brief, somewhat idiosyncratic, definitely speculative, but it represents an attempt to pose the problem in more structural and, and dialectical terms, whereby uh, continuity and change can be grasped together and not necessarily thought of, as they so often are, as opposed qualities. Thank you. Thank you. And I, too, would like to thank Rowan for the very uh, kind uh, invitation. I thought I'd go for polemical, but I've sort of ended up with paranoid. <laughs> um, but I, do, I will say that after 15 minutes of whinging, I do cheer up at the end. So. Victorian art is a curious category. On the one hand, it appears to be a clearly defined period with a growing scholarship. On the other hand, there is something anomalous here. Colleagues working on other geographical areas describe themselves as scholars of 19th century French art or 19th century American art in a way that we Victorianists tend not to. And within British art studies, there's a division between those who do the late 18th and 19th century often conceived as the great flowering of British art, particularly in portraiture and landscape, and those of us who then take up the story in the 1830s and 40s and, and later. It sometimes seems as if Victoria's accession to the throne is merely a convenient proxy for the drawing of scholarly territories. But while Victorian art may serve as a period for bureaucratic and institutional purposes, it is, certainly in the history of art, very problematic, at least in the discipline's weaker incarnations. And indeed, the central problem arises from the use of Victorian as an art historical term. We use it as if it's straightforwardly descriptive. But when used in art history, Victorian doesn't just signal a reign, a chronological measure. It also inevitably describes a kind of art. It's not simply defined by the dates within which one works, but is freighted with assumptions and prejudices. To talk about Victorian painting to anyone gives most people, I think, an instant sense of its visual and moral dimensions in a way that wouldn't be the case if one were talking about 19th century painting. So I want to say a few words about the complexities of Victorian as a period in art, in history of art. And I'm thinking specifically about history of art here. And the way that the period in my discipline is not only about historical limits, continuities and breaks, beginnings and endings, but is muddled by other concerns, many of which really are very unhistorical. A central problem remains modernism. And we've been bickering about this for decades. And when I was writing this, I did start to feel as if I'd travelled back to the 1980s and the heady days of the so-called new art history. But decades later, I worry that modernism still has a stranglehold with problematic historical consequences. Modernism, the story of modern art, is conceived still as an overarching period constituted by smaller stylistic units. And I think the divisions within a period are symptoms of how that period itself is conceived. Art history often shapes the Victorian era as a progressive movement from the banal and the vulgar to increasing conceptualism. So in the history of sculpture, for example, there's an orthodox narrative which moves us from ideal sculpture through various kinds of realism into something called pre-Raphaelite sculpture, whatever that might be, 
until the watershed of 1877 and Leighton's athlete is reached when new sculpture, and a contentious and misleading term if ever there was, promises a new world of sculpture beginning to understand itself as sculpture. But style is by no means self-evident. What constitutes a style? Which features count and which don't? How style changes? The causal processes? The relationship between the individual and the general? None of these is theoretically secure. And as such, style is woefully inadequate and unhistorical as a means of structuring periodization. And yet modernism, I think, still insists that this is how periods are constituted. As Rowan mentioned, I was one of the curators of an exhibition uh, called Sculpture Victorious at the Yale Centre for British Art in New Haven. And when I was at an event while the show was up, uh, an art historian, who was not an academic but a scholar nevertheless, made some very kind comments to me, but then remarked that he thought the show needed reorganising. The problem, he said, there was that he wanted to know what order things happened in. When sculptures were making antique things, when they then started making medieval things, when they started working in ceramics, and so on. Of course, if he'd read the labels, he would have discovered that these were all contemporaneous. They all happened at the same time. But he clearly had this template of a period in his head whereby things had to happen one at a time. It had to be parceled up into discrete uh, stylistic units, which somehow explained historical process. And I think this, for me, was also a reminder that the question of eclecticism is something that Victorianists, certainly Victorian art historians, need to address much more robustly. In these narratives, art history still seems to adhere, even if only implicitly, to modernism's teleological impulse. The idea of a necessary historical process by which art comes to realise itself. Art unfolds in time, style by style, movement by movement, until it finally reaches abstraction and the full understanding of its own nature. Again, this is not only about a conception of art, but a conception of historical periods too. And Victorian art has a very problematic place in this story. In many accounts, it's simply not part of the process. That takes place elsewhere in other countries. In other accounts, the Victorian period does offer some things that are part of that unfolding story, but these are the things that are understood as somehow resisting and challenging the Victorian. So modernism, I think, tends to be read backwards into the 19th century and discovered in prototype form in the Pre-Raphaelites or in aestheticism. We might also consider what's included in Victorian art. This is another point at which periodization and aesthetics come into conflict. Well, Constable had the good grace to die conveniently in 1837, for which many art historians are very grateful. But Turner died in 1851, and so clearly had a career as a Victorian artist. Yet the scholarship somehow removes him from Victorianism. He transcends the period and avoids the taint of Victorian art, serving more as the final glorious maverick flowering of an 18th century landscape tradition. Similarly, an artist like Whistler is often valued because he apparently resists Victorianism. He breaks free, cocking a snook at the stuffy Victorian world and looking forward to modernism. The period, the age, is not simply an historical location for these artists, but what they challenge and escape from. And I think in this sense, the myth of the avant-garde continues to support the notion that great artists somehow stand outside their historical period. 
Similarly, in scholarship, one too often finds a distinction, a related distinction, between artists who are treated as artists, Rossetti, for instance, and artists who is treated as social symptoms, someone like Mulready, say. And this, too, I think, is a consequence of periodization and the internal divisions used to structure it. Some artists fit that template, while others do not. So some artists get a kind of a career as artists. Others are just, in a way, illustrations to a different kind of history. Of course, what's so telling about these conceptions of the Victorian age and its art is that they're largely about personal taste. And the creation of periods in art history, not always, but has often been inextricable from taste. The Victorian period has a particular problem here, and I mean, uh, David referred to this, but you'll all be aware that it's so often been characterised as the period of bad taste, which is why historians have made such strenuous efforts to rescue figures like Turner and Whistler from Victorianism, to identify them as modernists ahead of their time. You'll also be aware that this animus goes back to the 19th century itself, but as an historical question, I think it's crystallised by the attitudes of figures like the Bloomsbury Group. And the locus classicus for the modern notion of Victorianism as a period of failure must be Virginia Woolf's Orlando. The novel is, of course, profoundly hostile to the 19th century and its culture, characterised by this much-quoted moment when Orlando, driving through London, sees a monument or trophy, quote, a conglomeration of the most heterogeneous and ill-assorted objects piled higgledy-piggledy in a vast mound where the statue of Queen Victoria now stands. Draped about a vast cross of fretted and floriated gold were widow's weeds and bridal veils. Hooked on to other excrescences were crystal palaces, bassinets, military helmets, memorial wreaths, trousers, whiskers, wedding cakes, cannon, Christmas trees, extinct monsters, globes, maps, elephants, and mathematical instruments. At a stroke, Wolf dismisses the intellectual and cultural and scientific worlds of the 19th century as detritus. As still happens, she mistakes intellectual and cultural range for incoherence, again, the problem of dealing with eclecticism. And she mistakes profound curiosity for shallow distraction. In short, she mistakes her own taste for history. And if I sound a bit bitter here, there is a kind of personal <laughs> grudge, because what she could be describing is the Sculpture Victorious exhibition that I curated. So I kind of, it, uh, it resonates. I don't say this merely to rail at those who don't like the art of Victorian Britain. Whether they or I like this stuff is, for the purposes of writing history, neither here nor there. But that's the point, that periodization, defined by taste and aesthetic preference, is historically misbegotten. In part, this may simply be a sign of a more general problem that haunts art history where periodization is often not simply a matter of dates, but is all too easily bound up with the muddling of history with criticism of past events with present taste. I don't have a conclusion or a prescription for change. Would it help if we dispensed with the Victorian period and insisted instead on 19th century British art or 19th century British and imperial art, perhaps? And indeed, the problems I've outlined here are magnified further with the use of the term Edwardian, particularly in history of art. So taking the 19th century up to 1914 might also be helpful. Alternatively, one could carve up history differently. Design historians, for instance, have often used the dates 1851 to 1951, from the Great Exhibition to the Festival of Britain. And also a return to the longue durée would also be of benefit in rethinking periods. In history of art, there's been a tendency to focus more and more on particular historical moments, generally through a single work, which has severely limited our thinking 
about periods and their relationship to each other. And I'm, I'm as guilty of that as, as anyone. As a scholar of American art, I'd have to say that my period of expertise was 1897 to 1901, which is hardly the great panoramic sweep of history. <laughs> All these things might help us dispense with the idea of the Victorian as an in-between period. It helped to disentangle these different conflicting notions of what a period is, the period as historical and the period as an aesthetic category. However, and this is where I cheer up, I'm not sure I do need a prescription for change. In the end, perhaps it's less about the period and more about the questions one asks of it. Scholarship on 19th century British art has flourished remarkably in the age of Victorian studies. And I like to think that, it, in part, this is thanks to institutions like Babs and Nabza and to journals like Victorian Studies and the Journal of Victorian Culture. It may be that the periodization of the Victorian across disciplines has been more productive than limiting. After all, if one thinks of the work of the leading scholars of Victorian art, and I'm thinking of people like Lynn Mead and Caroline Arscott, their work is unaffected by the problems I've outlined. And I think that's because they understand history of art as history, not criticism, not appreciation, and not modernism's garbled narrative. I've no doubt the Victorian art studies could benefit from rethinking periodization, but it could also benefit from simply rejecting some of art history's aesthetic myths. Thank you.